Okay, hello everyone. Happy Mid Autumn Festival and welcome to the second session of Entrepreneurship Academy 2020. So before we start, let me answer frequently asked questions on recording. We have been recording all these sessions and we will share you the recording after edition, probably after half of the session. So no worry, we will send you the links. Okay, so today we will talk about design thinking. Let me introduce our speakers first. Keith is the co-founder and CEO of InnoPage Limited, a mobile app development style. Since 2010, Keith has led InnoPage to receive multiple industry awards, including Hong Kong ITC awards and Innovative Entrepreneurs Award for its innovative technology and products. He has been a mentor from various startup programs, as well as a part-time lecturer at Hong Kong Baptist University. Without further delays, let me pass the time to Kriv. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, today, we are going to talk about um, design thinking. So let me share the screen first. Okay, uh, here it goes. Okay, so everybody should see the screen. Okay, so let's start. A um, little bit about myself. Uh, well, I've been in the uh, mobile apps industry for almost 10 years, and uh, we have developed around uh, uh, 200, 300 apps for uh, uh, various companies, including a lot of startups. So uh, in the course of uh, doing our own uh, startups, as well as doing other people's apps, uh, we found uh, design and uh, user experience is an essential part of the um, of, of their success. So uh, when we talk about design thinking, and, and uh, I was told I have one hour, so I, I made this following slide. Okay. This one slide uh, uh, concludes all, all everything you need to know for design thinking. Um, so a very brief introduction to, to design thinking. This is from a company, a very famous company called Ideal, and it is regarded as the design thinking company. So uh, it promotes design thinking for many years. And uh, when people talk about design thinking, they think about Ideal. Uh, more on that later. And so first thing you, you need to know is uh, there is, is no official definition for design thinking. Nobody owns the word. No academic uh, uh, or, or any uh, industry leaders own design thinking. So uh, if you believe it's design thinking, it is design thinking. But uh, one of the major driving force is ideal. So uh, on the ideal design thinking website, you will see these uh, illustrations. And on the very left side, uh, there is a uh, intersection of three, uh, three variables, desirability, viability, and feasibility. And it says the intersection where design thinking lies. Uh, desirability is easy to understand. People want it, people decide for it. Uh, viability means economic viability. So it has to be uh, economically viable, commercially viable. And feasibility is about uh, the te technology, technical feasibility. So if it's desirable and is technically feasible and economically viable, then we have to think about how we deliver the product using design thinking method. And in the middle, there's a one uh, very important concept of uh, diversion and conversion of thinking. So uh, in the what they call the IDA stage, they try to uh, think of as many creative solutions as possible. So you diverge the, the choices. And then you pick one that is uh, feasible and viable and uh, worth to uh, explore more. And converge all these uh, many choices into uh, limited choices and then pick the very good one. And when you get the idea, you go to the, uh, the, the third uh, core activity 
uh, which is uh, ideation, implementation, and uh, uh, inspiration. So it's, it's a loop. So you observe what people use, uh, how people use a product, uh, how, how they do things, and then you generate a lot of ideas on how to make it better and then implement it uh, using uh, prototypes and, and, uh, and testing methods. So essentially, uh, the three major concepts of design thinking are listed out on this page. So then I can go back in time and talk about a little bit history of how design thinking becomes what it is we know today. So, uh, and uh, before, before we go into the history, uh, we talk about uh, the major driving force of design thinking. So IDEO I've mentioned is a, uh, a design company and it has been uh, actively promoting the idea of design thinking for many years. So this is the design thinking company. And then also Stanford D School, which is the Stanford Design School also uh, has a lot of uh, contribution to the design thinking community. And of course, uh, I think uh, most of you will be familiar with Google Design Sprint, also took a lot of inspiration from the concept of design thinking. So these are the major driving force. Okay, so um, before we talk about the history, there's one person you need to know. Uh, this person is Don Norman. Don Norman is the UX guy, is a, uh, when we talk about user experience, you talk about Don Norman. When you talk about design thinking, you talk about user experience. So you have to uh, uh, learn about Don Norman. Uh, he's the, uh, the, I think the most um, inspirational uh, person in this field. So um, he is also the first person with a working title of uh, with the worst user experience where he, he worked at Apple. Uh, uh, who he was uh, uh, serving as the user experience architect and then later on become the vice president of Apple. So he says UX is everything. It's the way you experience the world, uh, your life, the service and app or computer system, uh, but it is a system that's everything. So we think about system. So, um, so Don Norman uh, is, the, is, the, um, is the major person in user experience and design thinking. But before Don Norman, there are other people also uh, uh, have a great influence in design thinking and user experience. So we go back in time and look at uh, the 1950s. Uh, there's a very famous product designer uh, called Henry Dreyfus. He designed a lot of, uh, of things that, that we use every day, like the uh, uh, dial-up phones and uh, uh, trains and, and many other things that he designed. And uh, he is one of the first person who has the concept of designing for people. So he designed products for human. Um, so he said, on the other hand, if people are made safer, more comfortable, more eager to purchase, uh, more efficient, or just plain happier, to make people happier is, is a key word. Um, by contact with a product, then the designer ha has succeeded. So he was a very, uh, uh, forward thinking person in the 1950s uh, already had the concept of designing products for human. And uh, to everyone's surprise, Walt Disney was also regarded as one of the pioneer in user experience. So he says, uh, uh, always in the state of becoming a place where the latest technology can be used to improve the lives of people. And when he said that, uh, it was when he introducing the Florida project, which is the Disneyland. When he introduced the Disneyland, he thought about using the latest technology to improve the lives of people. So uh, this is um, to surprise of many people. But he also has another quote that I would like to mention. He said, whatever you do, do it well. Do it so well that when people see you do it, they will want to come back and see you do it again. And, uh, and they will want to bring others to show them uh, how well you uh, do what you do. And if you think about it, you think about Google, 
or you think about Instagram, or you think about Facebook, or even you, if you think about TikTok, they are doing the same thing. They are doing something so well. They are not having you know uh, many uh, uh, different functions or features. They they do something that they do so well. Like Instagram, they share photos, but they do it so well, then people want to come back to see it again, and they want to show other people that how well you do. And this is uh, is a, is a universal principle. Uh, it, just like if you build a Disneyland or if you build an app, it's the same thing. So uh, this picture illustrates uh, um, user experience and design. If you design something that is against the, um, uh, the comfort of the users, then the users will find another way to, to, to use it. So uh, this picture depicts uh, when you have a design that is it doesn't fit the usage of the users. That is what. Seems we have some technical issues happen. So please raise up one moment and be patient. Thank you. Yeah, we're getting back, Keith. Right, I'm yeah. back. <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry. Where, where was I? Where was I? I uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, use, use experience and and okay. design design like yeah, the shortcut yeah okay uh, uh have i speak about this slide or not yeah 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 already okay yeah. all right so i'm on this this slide exactly. okay or, or, or this one this one right the, the previous one the previous one previous one okay right yeah, we were on this one so, so you never yeah. see see a pavement in, in disney like 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 this one because the design is against the uh, uh people's uh, normal usage. So if you design something that is uh, that doesn't make the users happy, they will find their way to use it. All right. So fast forward to 2020. So uh, Don Norman uh, uh, said in a in his new book uh, called Re uh, Rethinking Design Thinking, he said uh, the designers don't try to search for solution until they determine the real problem. Uh, so we go to the root of the problem, and even then, instead of solving that problem, they stop to consider a wide range of potential solutions. So that uh, goes back to the first slide, that uh, how we diverge the thinking. Uh, we we try to have many as many solutions as possible, and then we converge it and pick one that really works. And uh, only then will they find uh, finally converge upon their, their uh, proposal. This process is for design thinking. So the design thinking man's definition of design thinking is this. Okay. So now, I, this is my one of my favorite GIF. Um, it shows you a door that's meant to be pushed, but uh, the user is trying to pull it because there's a handle, and we have a name for this. There's a name for this kind of doors. This kind of doors is called the Norman door. Norman as in Don Norman. Don Norman invented the name for the uh, these kind of doors. So what's a Norman door? A Norman door is a door where the design tells you to do the opposite of what you are actually supposed to do. And a door that gives the wrong signal and needs a sign to correct it. So you often see a door that is meant to be pushed, but it has a handle in it. So you will see a label on the door saying push. So this is exactly what the Norman door uh, does. The Norman door is, tells you, you know, exactly what the opposite of what you're actually supposed to do. So um, Don Norman wrote the book in the 80s and called the design of everyday things. And he, he go into great lengths into discussing the, uh, the, the Norman door. So this is 
when he uh, invented the term human uh, cent uh, human centered design. So it's designing uh, for humans. So um, the essentially is uh, Donovan always think of the people, which is the users and the goal of the people and find and solve the fundamental root problem. And because everything is interconnected, you have to think the product as a system, not just the product or not just a feature. If you focus on solving the problem of one feature, then you miss, all, you miss the whole system. So you have to think like as a system. So uh, this picture shows a, uh, a, a BMW 3 Series and a Tesla Model 3. There are 62 buttons inside the BMW 3 Series and only six buttons for the Model 3, which is better, um, I can't say, but uh, for myself, I, I think having less button is uh, more logical. Of course, I'm, I, I, I don't, I, 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 I miss some buttons. I miss some physical buttons like the uh, air condition and, and things like that. But for myself, because I, I do drive a Tesla Model 3, um, uh, over time, you will appreciate the simplest of the uh, design, which has uh, as, as little numbers of buttons as possible. Um, okay, so um, we talk a lot of uh, uh, UX design and human-centered uh, human design because this is before uh, ideal um, discovered the term design thinking. The design thinking wasn't, wasn't uh, invented by IDEO or, or, or Stanford Design School or Don Norman. Um, design thinking was, um, was a book published by a Harvard urban designing um, professor in the 80s. Uh, he, has, he has a book called Design Thinking and it's nothing about product design, it's about urban design. And then uh, IDEO took the uh, design thinking, uh, um, the words, and then um, promote it to become the um, uh, the process we, we know today. And but before they have design thinking, uh, they they use in, as human centered design concept to do this uh, very much the same thing. And Ideal was uh, one of the, um, um, the the design company that heavily used human-centered design, which, is, which was invented by Don Norman. So the process is simple. It's inspiration, uh, ideation, and implementation. So you observe what people, what people uh, uh, how, how, they, how they do things, how they use a the product, and then you generate ideas on identify opportunities for design, and then implement it, and then test it, and then uh, go back to to uh, the inspiration stage, so it's very much the uh, design thinking process we we know today. So this is the um, uh, which I would say the the almost official um, diagram for for design thinking. When you go to Stanford, when you go to IDEO, when you go to uh, NN Group, which is the Norman Nielsen Group founded by Don Norman, you will find this chat. Uh, it says uh, there are three stages, understand, explore, and materialize. And there are uh, five or six, depending on, on uh, which, which school you go to. Uh, so understanding means emphasize, which understanding, observing the user, and then defining the problem. You have to go to the root of the problem. You, you don't go to the end of the problem. You don't solve a problem with one feature of a product. You solve the whole system, which you have to go to the root of the problem. And then you do the idea uh, process, which means generate many ideas, uh, as many ideas as possible, and pick the right one. And then do the prototype. And after doing the prototype, you put it into test. And then you go back to the prototype, and if it doesn't work, you go back to, to IDA and then go back to uh, the previous process. And when everything seems to be um, uh, uh, getting together, you implement it and then put it to the, to the test, uh, put it on the market and test it, and then you 
go back to the, uh, the, the emphasize stage and then keep improving it. So one of the key concepts of the design thinking process is you never stop. You keep going back and keep improving. So it's very much like uh, the lean startup concept that you may have come across. So because today we have so very limited time, so I'm not going to talk about each stage of the design thinking process, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the emphasize stage. The rest, you, you, may, you may sort it out yourself uh, going online and, and looking at other materials, but uh, I'm going to talk about how I do, how my company uh, uh, do uh, the, uh, what we do at the emphasize stage. Okay, but before I get into that, I have to uh, make another, another quote from uh, Henry Ford. Um, he said, if I ask people what they want, they would have said a faster horse or faster horses uh, because they never seen an automobile. They never seen a car. There, there, there were no, no automobiles in, in his days. They were only horses. So, um, for people like Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs like to quote a lot of uh, uh, this uh, Henry Ford uh, quote. Um, for people like Steve Jobs, they, they don't do any um, uh, focus group. He, he doesn't believe in it uh, because he, he thought uh, uh, they would never know what they want until you show it to them. But not everybody is Steve Jobs. So for, for the rest of us, we may have to do some observation and some uh, uh, user research to understand what the users want. Okay, so in the emphasize stage, we, um, we do focus group and we may do questionnaires, but mostly focus group. We observe how people use the product. We uh, listen to them and uh, talk to them and uh, get to know things that we don't know. We couldn't do that with a questionnaire. We, we can do something with a questionnaire, but not uh, understanding deeply um, what they really uh, uh, want or how they feel, or, uh, what's the experience. So we don't do a lot, of, a lot of listening in the focus group. We uh, um, uh, let them to talk and then we try to understand what they really need or what, they're, what, what problem they're facing or what experience they're, they're, they're facing. So, uh, and then we develop personas, which is uh, a, a typical profile of, of a targeted users. Uh, we may have uh, several different personas, but um, we, we can't do everybody. Uh, we have to pick the major uh, uh, customers or users and then have a deeper understanding on, on this person. So we develop several personas to understand uh, uh, their backgrounds and uh, what they need. And then we will map um, the, the user journey with the personas. So uh, the, the journey starts from discovering your uh, product, maybe an app or maybe, maybe a surface or, or anything. So uh, the, the journey begins with discovery. So there are many other solutions to solve the same problem. Why do they have to pick your product or your service? So you have to under, understand why. And then each step uh, from discovering your product to actually using your product to, uh, if, it is, if it is an app, uh, if they lock out and then uh, and, and, and goes, come back to your, to your app and then lock in again, this whole journey, we have to um, analyze each stage, um, the experience of the users of each stage. What do they experience? What are the positive experience? What are the negative experience? And what are the pain points? If there's a negative experience or there's a pain point, how might we solve it? Or what is the root problem? If we understand the root problem, then we can uh, generate ideas at the idea, uh, the idea stage to find a way to solve that problem. But first thing we have to do is to identify the problem. To identify the problem, we have to understand the experience. So, and then uh, after analyzing each, each step, each stage of the user journey, we can put it into an empathy map and we, we try to understand more about their feelings. There, there are many other maps. There are, there are empathy maps and there are other maps. Uh, 
uh, you have to pick the one that is uh, uh, suitable for you. So you, you, can't, you can't do everything because um, uh, there's just, just too many of them. But uh, sometimes, I mean, most of the time we, we do empathy map to understand more about the user's feelings. Okay. And then uh, we finish, almost finished the emphasize stage. So we understand uh, how the how the use product or un understand uh, uh, how they feel on each stage. Then we have to uh, define the problem. Those are, so the second the second stage of understanding uh, the users is to define the root problem so that we can ideate generate ideas to solve those problems, which uh, we don't have time to cover today. So um, I'm going to close this. Uh, presentation with uh, oh no not yet I'm going to talk about a little bit about the Android and iOS design guidelines because sometimes when we design a product um, if it if it is an app we, we can't just do anything that we like so we we, we can't say uh, uh, we have a lot of left-handed uh, users so we we mirror the uh, iOS or Android uh, uh, user interface. We, we probably can't do that. There are, there are limitations, there are constraints, there are technical considerations uh, when you are designing an app. So uh, it's, it's important to understand the iOS and Android design guidelines that will make your programmers uh, much easier to, to, to do the design and maintaining the, the, um, the app. So uh, uh, having the, the uh, generating a lot of ideas doesn't mean you, you can have wild ideas and then ignore the design guidelines. You still have to stick with the, the guidelines of the devices. All right, so I'm going to close this uh, presentation with, with a quote with, uh, from Steve Jobs. He says, um, design is not just what it looks like and feels like design is how it works. So uh, it's very important because sometimes when we design things, we do what we like what the founders like. We, we don't think too much about the users. Uh, we don't uh, think a lot how the users use the product. We think about how we want the users to use the product. But um, many times when we, uh, when, when we not think too uh, thorough about what the users want, we will come up with product like, like these ones. So whatever you do, you don't do this. Because and when you do when you just do uh, a product design that looks pretty to you or the the uh, product owner uh, and forget about the users, you got these kind of products. So uh, that concludes my presentation. So uh, thank you very much uh, for coming today, and um, uh, I'm open for Q and A. So back to okay. you, Thomas. Okay, so we see there is a one question in the Q&A button. Okay, the first one asks about how can one apply the design thinking to product developments within a large team given there is no specific guidelines to follow? Uh, well, uh, design thinking is a process. So um, with a large team, uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand the question. So. Uh, by by the meaning of large team, does it mean uh, 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 say you know no uh, uh, twenty developers or, or something like that? I am not sure. But uh, for for average um, design team, a product design team, you probably don't have a lot of people. So uh, at the design stage, you don't have to get everybody to involve. You can get some representative from the uh, development team. You can get representative from the users team or, or the marketing team. You don't have to get everybody uh, to, to on board on the design stage. So uh, how we do it is uh, we, we sometimes run design thinking workshop for clients. So they have around, uh, uh, on average, 15 person, 15 representative from different departments and we gather them into one room and then we run through a workshop and uh, introduce a method and then try to design uh, uh, the product with them. So you don't need, to need a uh, you know, 50, 70 person uh, team to do that. You can have as 
little as uh, 10 to 15 person to do it. Okay, so for the second question, we can see that um, for a student looking to work in the mobile app industry, what programming language do you advise the student to learn? There are cross-platform languages like we we add native and footers and also native language mm. like switch and cotton co cotton okay okay um well uh, my short answers to it is to get familiar with one particular platform if you like ios or if you use an iphone uh go for swift uh don't try to start with uh, cross-platform uh, 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 technologies like uh, Flutter or, or uh, React Native. Um, um, there's a very, very, very uh, high-profile case of uh, Airbnb. They, they wrote a five-part uh, essay on uh, Medium to explain why they uh, gave up React Native and goes back to uh, uh, native development using uh, Kotlin and, and Swift. Because simply, um, if you want to master a cross-platform language, it means you have to master at least three things. You have to master uh, iOS, you have to master Android, and you have to master React Native. It's, it's, it's a very difficult task. So um, my, my advice is to go for one platform first, either Kotlin or Swift, and then work on it. And other questions. Could you go over the outcomes of focus groups again, please? Okay, uh, the outcomes of focus group. Um, all right, this is the screen. Um, we identify the thought of users about a particular product or service, provide deeper understanding of for user behavior. So uh, if you see the uh, uh, photos, say, oh, this is not our photos. Uh, because when we run focus group, we focus on two things. Uh, first thing is how they use the product. If it's an existing product and they want to enhance it, we give them the product to use and we do recordings. We record how they use the product. We record their facial expression. We record their, their finger gesture and we record where they, uh, uh, um, uh, they have a negative experience. And another one, uh, another key uh, objective is to, uh, we will talk to them, we, um, we let them talk, and then we listen, and we try to ask them questions, open questions, and then try to find out uh, 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 answers or find out issues that we are not aware of. So it's, there's a lot of talking, a, a lot of listening, and a lot of question asking, and a lot of observation. Uh, it's, it's not like a questionnaire where you have uh, preset questions and preset answers, and you ask them a question, they give you an answer. Uh, uh, that's not how we do it. Uh, we do a lot of open questions, a lot of listening, a lot of uh, you know, uh, analysis afterwards, and uh, recording and observation of how they use a the product. So another question is, um, how much time do you spend on every stage of the design thinking process? Like 50% 50, 50 for empathy, 20% for uh, uh, ideations, or 30% for execution? Uh, well, I think an average um, uh, project, uh, uh, I think we spend most of the time on the um, emphasize and define stage. That's, that's the most, most difficult part because IDA means generating ideas. There are methods to generate ideas, but um, uh, we, as, as creative industry people, we are good at that. And prototyping, we can, we can uh, you know, uh, um, just uh, uh, do a prototype in, in very short time, but understanding the, the problem understanding users take most of the time. So it, it's probably, uh, uh, I, I think it's, it, uh, it's around, around that, pro, uh, that portion, big proportion, 50% uh, empathy, yeah, 20% ideation, something like that, yes. Okay, let me check. So other questions. Other than questionnaire, what other tools can the designer use to know how the user feel? Okay, um, well, um, 
Uh, I, I personally, I don't really uh, think questionnaires uh, is is um, is too useful when doing um, uh, the the emphasize stage. So um, the questionnaire is is only just for reference or or just for uh, um, you know just for the sake of it. So we have we have some question reset and re in in most of the time we already know the answers before we send out the questionnaire we can guess what the answers so uh it's um uh it's it's not a a, a very uh useful tool so to understand the users i have to talk to them i have to um i have to pick the right person because uh, you can't talk to everybody because there are just too many of them, too many different kinds of people, too many different kinds of users. You have to uh, pick the the um, target audience that, that you want to serve and then uh, observe what they do, uh, uh, like what uh, how we do it in the, in the focus group. Uh, but uh, that's, that's a difficult question because there's actually not many tools we can use. Okay, so another question is that there are three models of design thinking you have shown in at the beginning. So which one do you find it the most relevant to your own innovation experience? Oh, well, um, there's, there's only one model, actually. Uh, there, uh, there are not three models. Uh, on the first slide, I, I show the, uh, the the essence, the essence of design thinking, which the first thing is uh, where design thinking lies, which is uh, when when desirability, viability, and feasibility meets. That's where design thinking is useful. And then the second uh, concept is to uh, diverge uh, and then converge the the choices, the idea, the solutions. And then the first one, uh, the third one is the uh, three steps, uh, which is essentially uh, what used to call the uh, human-centered design. And then when they expand the idea of human-centered design, they make the, uh, they, they turn it from a three-step uh, process into a six-step process. So uh, it is, um, um, there's only one process uh, of design thinking. And uh, in most cases, we go through all these six steps. So it's, all these steps are relevant. Another question asks about when speaking to VCs regarding funding, sometimes to request an optimization of the product development budgets. So is there any way to predict the length and cost of a prototyping process? Uh, well, this is a uh, difficult one. Um, I, I think for uh, technical founders, they, they probably do their own prototype themselves. So, so they, they don't take salary, so they can uh, do as long as they, as they want. Um, so I think um, uh, when you talk to VC, uh, uh, I, I think the correct answer is um, there's no ending to to the prototyping pro, uh, prototyping process. Um, they are iteration of a product. So you roll out a what uh, the startup industry called the MVP, the minimum viable product, and then you keep improving on that MVP. So it, the the process never ends and, and until it becomes a, a viable product in the market. And after uh, you launch the the product in the market, you keep improving it. So uh, I, I don't think there's, there's uh, a way to estimate the uh, approximation of the, of the budget. Um, but uh, if, if you're technical founders or when your uh, team has a, a technical founders, then you may minimize the, the cost by doing it yourself. Another question asks about um, would you suggest conducting this design thinking process systematically, or is this just an explanation of what actually ends up happening, rather than a method to follow? Oh, well, um, this design thinking process, 
uh, I, I run these kind of workshops for clients because some of my clients, they have a rough idea. They, they don't really know what it will come out uh, when, when the design is finished. They just have an idea of what they want to do. So to help them to, uh, uh, to, make a, uh, to, to create great product, we run through all these six process with them. It depends on how, how much time they have. Sometimes I, I do a one day workshop and then uh, take their ideas, very rough ideas, and turn it into design. Or sometimes we, we do a three-day workshops and, and, and uh, let them uh, have more inputs to, to, their, uh, to the design. And for ourselves, for our internal projects, we do go through this process and then we have, uh, we have heated debates. We have uh, uh, you know, a whole day uh, idea, uh, idea generation day. And, this is actually uh, uh, a, a method that, that we do on our work. And uh, so, so I suggest everybody should at least try once when you're designing your own product. Another question that they asked about, I guess design thinking or process needs to be trained. Practice makes perfect. From your experience of developing apps or running a tech company, what is the toughness lesson to go through such design thinking process? Does your client support such approach? Well, um, the, 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 the tough lesson is to get people to, um, to um, not to jump to the conclusion. Because in the design thinking process, when we generate ideas, um, we, we don't see a problem and then give it an answer. This is what managers do. And, and uh, the clients we, uh, working with us are mostly managers trained by you know, local universities uh, or their corporate training. And all, all the training of all their lives is to solve problems. When they see a problem, they give you an, a solution. They immediately give you a solution. And the problem with that is you uh, rule out many other possibilities. They think if I, have a problem, if I have a problem, I give you one solution that works and that's enough. And they, and they don't have to think about the other, you know, hundreds of other ideas that, that may work or may work better or may be more creative. So um, uh, it's very difficult to, to have our clients uh, to um, forget about giving uh, answers uh, to, a, to, to a problem, uh, uh, to, to think of crazy ideas. That's, that's not what they um, train for. So, uh, and, and then we have to do a lot of education to ask them to uh, forget about solving problems. Uh, just focus on the root problem and then be, be crazy, be bold to think of, uh, uh, in all of the box ideas. That's the tough one. Another feedback and question. So thank you for your presentation. Just wondering how to enter the field of user experience design and any suggestion to a better equip ourselves? Okay. Um, uh, uh, for the first thing is I don't think there is a field of UX design in Hong Kong. We we are struggling to uh, uh, to get our our customers to understand the importance of UX design. So we have been doing this for for the last few years, and uh, it's improving. So uh, many clients now uh, are, are more aware of uh, UX design, but I I don't think it's is um, big enough to become a field of its own. But if you want to become uh, a UX designer, uh, then I, I think you will um, need to have some basic uh, hard skills on, on design first, because they, if, if, you, if you're not a, uh, a designer with hard skill like the uh, uh, Adobe design uh, software suite, then, um, then you, you, you cannot realize your, your own ideas. 
uh, which makes it a disadvantage. So I, I think to go into the so-called UX design field, you must become a, a competent uh, uh, a designer, a digital designer first, and then you improve your, your UX uh, design skills. Okay, another question related to user experience and UI. So um, he asked, if I later hire designers, is it better to hire user experience designer and UI designer separately or someone good in both fields? Okay, uh, <coughs> so it's related to the last question is, um, I do not believe there is a role called UX uh, designer. I, uh, UX and UI for me, for myself, always goes hand in hand, goes together. So you cannot have a, a, a designer only good at UX design and doesn't know how to do UI or you, 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 you don't want to have a UI designer that doesn't understand UX. If you don't understand UX, how do you develop a good UI? So I think um, UI uh, design or, or the, the traditional uh, uh, digital designer uh, require some hard skills. They, they need to understand and how to use uh, Photoshop or, or uh, Illustrator or uh, Figma or, or, or other other tools. Um, so they have to uh, be a designer itself, uh, be a digital designer uh, on its own, on, on their own. Or, and then to study um, UX design, because UX design is something that a normal person can understand uh, with you know, enough experience, you, you will understand how to do a good UX design, but without the UI design skill or digital design skills, you cannot bring your ideas to life. So a uh, simple answer is you want to have one that is, that's good in both. So the next question is, I'm working in the media industry currently, so where should I start to, uh, innovate a new influence with my own skills across different industries. Okay. Um, uh, you innovate a new influence with my own skill. Mm, um, I'm not sure whether I understand fully uh, on, on this question, but um, I think to innovate, um, or influence your 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 own company or your own your own industry. You have to almost um, uh, every time you you have to come up with something something new, something uh, radical, something that uh, uh, some something that change the the way how how we work. Uh, if you find something that is um, that doesn't make sense to you, but it just becomes some kind of a dogma, some 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 kind of what people used to do, and and you think that's not the way to do it. Then try to try to come up with a new idea. Uh, uh, like when when a few years back, I I tried to do a four day work week because I want to reserve one day for my staff to do some innovation, uh, which I I I what I failed. <laughs> didn't didn't have much success, but uh, that's how I. Uh, uh, try to do, you know, use my 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 um, my influence to to do something different. So the next question is, thanks for the amazing talk. And then there are two questions. The first one is, how do you process all the feedback received from the focus groups or the user research? Because sometimes the suggestions from the focus groups tends to be very broad. So how do you narrow it down to implement your points? Okay. Um, well, the, uh, when we do a focus group, we do it in parts. Like uh, if we are uh, trying to understand uh, the um, uh, an app, then we will do it separately, uh, 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 like each part. So we will ask them to uh, use each functions, 
or we, we ask them to do some navigation on the app or we try to uh, give different tasks for them to finish. So when we finish the, uh, uh, the focus group, we will have a report on each part of, the, um, of what people uh, uh, do. So if, if there's a task one, task two, task three, we will have you know, a group of you know, 10 or 20 people doing task one and then doing task two and task three. And then we're breaking down into, into sessions. Uh, likewise, when we, when we talk to them, when we listen to them, um, we will summarize the uh, answer of the question and we try to focus on the insight, uh, things that we don't know, uh, and put it into a report. The report is, uh, is, is in, in, uh, uh, has some links. So we probably have you know, something like 50 uh, pages of report when we finish the focus group. Okay, another question is, how do you choose the right people for focus groups? And do you have any criteria to choose the potential focus group candidates? Because users are not always buyers for the product. Yeah, well, so um, the first thing we want to do is uh, we will identify uh, what kind of users uh, uh, that are my targets. Uh, if I have a app that is targeted to teenagers, then I will I will do the teenagers group first. Uh, of course, I will also want to explore like a, a younger uh, audience and maybe a more mature audience. But the main group will be the the teenagers, which are my target customers. And uh, also, uh, I would like to uh, um, get and numbers of different types of people. Some may be um, the fans of our, our service. Maybe let's say I have a, a, a existing product which I want to develop an app. Then I will have a, a group of loyal customers. And then I will have a, a, a group of people that have heard of our product but, but never use it. And, and then I have a, a group of people that have never used or heard of our products. So we want to have a variety of uh, different groups. Um, but if I have limited resources, then I will focus on my target customer first and then uh, see uh, uh, what can I do with the other groups. Okay, Thanks. another question is what is the greatest bottleneck for design thinking when you are developing your product or service? Okay, the greatest bottleneck. Uh, the greatest bottleneck uh, for, for myself uh, at this moment is to balance the, uh, the design and the uh, development cost because we have great ideas. We, we know how to uh, make great designs, but to implement those designs, we need time and we need uh, uh, resources. We need people to do it. So how do we balance it? Uh, or we have a feature that we know if we implement that, we may run into into problems for uh, um, you know a long term uh, maintenance. Uh, we want to do a, a very customized uh, UI control, let's say. Then we may have a long term maintenance uh, uh, hurdle. So it's it's kind of um, balancing the the design and the and the resources, which is uh, one of the bottlenecks that I'm facing right now. Okay. Is there okay. any questions from the audience? Okay, so thank you very much for the presentation and answering around 16 questions from our audience. So, so happy Mid Autumn Festival, Zhong Chao Zifalo, and happy nice weekend, everyone. Okay, we will see each other next Wednesday. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye.